Um, I just quickly want to uh, cover a few um, kind of topics about tomato insect pests that we've been hearing a little bit about in the past maybe a couple years. Um, nothing that you really need to be majorly concerned with or things that you've, some of which you've probably seen before, but we just want you to be on the lookout. So let me get my laser pointer here. Hopefully you can see this. Um, so I'm going to very quickly cover um, three insects or insect culprits that um, I want to bring to everyone's attention if you were growing tomatoes on a small farm, a large farm in your backyard, like I did this past summer. Um, and those key insects are stink bugs. These are pretty common insects. Many of you surely see them, including the brown marmorated ones that are probably in your house. Um, the second insect I'll briefly mention um, are, is the tomato bug. And this is a little bit of a less common insect, but we have been seeing some samples come through the PPDL and some questions asked about it. So I wanna bring it to everyone's attention. And finally, tomato pinworm. And um, this is also a not, not so common insect in our area, but we're um, hearing some folks are having issues with it, uh, pretty serious issues um, in the last couple of years. And so I really wanna bring this one to your attention, um, tell you what to look for and um, I'll probably spend a little bit more time on this insect relative to the others. So, and then as we go through the presentation, I wanna cover some helpful resources for everyone, um, general management tips for each of the three insects um, I have listed here. And then I'll just quickly talk about um, resources available to you in the form of the Purdue Plant Pest Diagnostic Laboratory and also the Mid Midwest Vegetable Production Guide. Okay, so starting with stink bugs, the insect that many of you probably know are familiar with for some reason or another. There's many, many different kinds of stink bugs. Um, you all probably know that. And so I just have a few images here um, to kind of bring your attention to how similar they may appear. Um, but also a couple of these are the most common ones that um, I'm aware of in the region. So this one spotted stink bug is one of the most common stink bugs that will be feeding on tomatoes and other things. Um, Though it, the stink bug that I observed the most um, in my own garden this past year was this dusky stink bug. And I just have these pictures here side by side to show you um, how similar they look. So unless you get really close, um, you may not actually have the right stink bug. Not that it makes a huge difference for how you manage it. Um, unless it comes to brown marmorated stink bug. And this is the invasive stink bug, the one that's probably inside your house if you have any um, crawling around right now. And this one is a little bit different. Um, some of the insecticides are um, not as effective against certain stages of the stink bug. So I'm not gonna talk about that in detail, um, but just wanted to bring um, this invasive one to your attention and then these other native stink bugs uh, that may be um, showing up on your tomatoes here and there if you're looking. So why do we care about the stink bugs? Um, in a nutshell, the adults and the nymphs um, feed on the fruit and on the plants, but it's mainly the fruits that um, they leave the damage and can cause uh, points of entry for other pathogens to, to get in. So I wanna point out that you may not see the stink bugs that, that ever, you may never see the stink bugs that inflict the damage on your tomatoes. So just a point here, you'll often see the damage after, um, around the time or after the time of harvest. And I wanna show you some nice um, images here that I got from some of my colleagues actually who are a little bit more experienced with this, these insects and tomatoes. But I just wanna emphasize with these photos and the upcoming slides, that the damage um, may differ based on when the stink bug fed on the fruit, if it was a green uh, tomato or if it was a red tomato. And then of course, damage is a problem more so on whole pack and fresh market varieties. Of course, um, you know, no one wants to pick up a tomato or purchase one that has these little damaged um, or unsightly blemishes. So um, in terms of what stink bug damage looks like on tomato, if the stink bug fed on the tomatoes while they were green, you see this kind of yellow blotching, um, small spots, um, blotchy spots, I guess, on the fruit. And so this is just an example of, of one type of tomato, but this, um, this yellowing kind of blotching is diagnostic uh, for stink bugs on um, red tomatoes, and it could be all kinds of different tomatoes. So um, to make things challenging though, um, if the stink bugs fed on red fruits, here you can see the damage is quite a bit more subtle. I, I actually struggle to see um, these subtle cloudy white spots um, in these images that were shared with me, but you can point out here, there's a little bit of a lighter kind of cloud color. Um, you can actually maybe see some of the spots here where the stink bugs actually stuck their mouth parts in, which can cause damage. So um, this is the yellow blotches are gonna be more easily visible, 
Um, but if you look closely, these white blotches, and it may vary on, on the variety of tomato that you're growing, but you can see them if you look very carefully. So this is a really nice image um, from our expert photographer uh, in the Purdue Extension, John Obermeyer. Um, and th so you can see these are really nice, delicious looking tomatoes with these yellow diagnostic blotches um, from stink bugs. And again, this is when the stink bugs fed on the tomatoes while they were green. Let me just make sure I got that right. Okay, yeah. Okay, so nice images there. Um, when it comes to the stink bugs, um, I just wanna mention, first of all, I have this image here to remind me that they, this is their life cycle. Um, they are a true bug. So the, the nymphs look very like lip, smaller versions of the adults. They just don't have wings. So we have an adult brown marmorated stink bug here. This is what the eggs look like. And they hatch out and um, they'll kind of cluster around the eggs. And these will typically be on the leaves of tomato plants. And then they just get bigger and they feed because that's what stink bugs do. So just a few points here about um, stink bug feeding and their damage. New adults, and by new, I mean adults that have just uh, molted into their adult stage. So they got their wings for the first time. And also the older nymphs, um, larger individuals like this, you can see they still have the wing pads, not quite an adult yet like here. But these are the two that are gonna be inflicting uh, the most damage to tomatoes because they just, they're larger, they're feeding more. Um, and this is in contrast to other older adults. So, um, you know, stink bugs life is hard. Everything's trying to eat you and parasitize you. Um, they're old, they just don't feed as much. And of course the younger nymphs don't feed as much because they're just not as large. So um, I, I suspected folks might have questions about brown, brown marmorated stink bugs, um, in it, particularly because it's an invasive and it's one that's on a lot of our radars because they feed on a lot of different vegetables and fruits. And so I just wanted to um, mention some research out of Maryland that suggests that um, brown marmorated stink bugs really don't seem to eat uh, tomatoes. They rather prefer peppers um, and then sweet corn. And so, but that is of course, assuming that, you know, they don't have, they have other options. So if it's only tomatoes that they have available to them, then they will feed on them readily. Okay, so let's say that you have these tomatoes and you have damage. I found myself in this situation last fall and you wanna diagnose whether it's actually stink bug damage on the tomato. So how do you do that? We have these two different types of tomatoes with the damage that I mentioned before, the yellow blotch and these kind of cloudy white spots. So you wanna peel the skin back and look at the actual fruit under the skin and see what it looks like. So if it is stink bug damage, you're gonna see these kind of white plug-like spots on the fruit. And interestingly, you know, at least from my perspective, this damage looks more similar underneath the skin of the yellow blotch that looks pretty similar um, to the damage on the outside. But this, um, the white cloudy spots on the outside, when you peel that skin back, it actually looks way worse, um, um, this damage by stink bugs. So you kind of have this white kind of quirky like material or texture of, of the tomato underneath. Okay, so briefly, I wanna talk about some best management practices, um, just big picture kind of things for stink bugs. So if you have a lot of tomatoes, uh, say in your backyard on a small farm at the larger scale, you wanna have some type of weekly scouting plan and look for these stink bugs um, and also damage fruit throughout the season. So I just have um, some general timeframes here based on work that have been done in, in neighboring regions. Um, the easiest way to detect the stink bugs if you're out during the day scouting is to shake the canopy of the plants like over a tray or a bowl or a paper plate. Um, and, and if you shake it, you know, the stink bugs will fall off pretty readily and you'll be able to see them there and collect them and send them to us if you're not sure which stink bug it is. And then once you kind of get into July and August, you wanna examine the fruits for that stink bug injury that um, I uh, hopefully gave you some good examples of in the previous slides. So when you're out looking for stink bugs, you wanna typically look in the early morning or in the evening because that's when they're the most active. Um, I mentioned you may never see the stink bugs that cause the damage. And that's often because we're not out either early in the morning or um, later in the evening. But um, so you wanna look at those key times if you actually wanna catch the stink bugs in the act. And then you wanna be sure to check the interior and the edges of your crop. And so whether that, I don't have a hard number for you, it kinda depends on how big your, 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 your backyard, your garden, your farm is. Um, but regardless of that size, you definitely wanna be looking at the interior and the edges of the crop so that you don't miss any stink bugs that may be there. And if anyone has uh, specific questions about monitoring or maybe how many plants 
um, they need to scout for stink bugs, how many uh, fruits. I'm happy to share that information if anyone wants to get in contact with me and, and my information will be on the last, um, my last slide here, how to contact me. So um, I don't wanna go into a whole lot of detail about the insecticides, um, or partly because I'm running out of time already um, because of my technological issues, but um, say, suffice to say that there are several contact insecticides that are available and quite effective against stink bugs, things like pyrethroids, some of the neonicotinoids. Um, so a lot of options available to you, um, but of course, because if you are gonna be uh, you know, harvesting these tomatoes and shipping them or using them for uh, different purposes, just be sure to keep an eye on the pre-harvest intervals. And of course, rotate among uh, insecticide modes of action because these stink bugs, um, especially the brown marmorated stink bugs can be pretty challenging to, to knock down with insecticides. So we need to expose them to all the tools we have so they don't become resistant. Okay, so that was stink bug in a really fast whirlwind. Now I just wanna briefly talk about tomato bug. Um, and this was a, an insect brought to our attention this past fall, the first time I'd actually ever seen it. So I was pretty excited just from the kind of nerdy entomologist perspective. This one is uncommon, um, I would say. I haven't heard many people talking about it. If you look into um, the news and like extension blogs about this insect, we see, we're hearing a little bit more and more about it, but it's not like the one everybody thinks of as a major pest right now. So hopefully we're ahead of it and this will be a way for you to um, get a heads up. So like the stink bug, um, these are plant feeders. They have these straw-like mouth parts and they are feeding particularly on the stems of tomato plants and on the growing points of the plant. So right where the young, the young leaves are opening on uh, flower buds and on young fruits. So they're you know, pretty small adults are about a quarter of an inch long. And the nymphs, which you see here, uh, just appear as smaller wingless versions of the adults. So I have another slide um, where you can see the adult a little bit more clearly, but these don't have any wings. And, um, you know, some of you may be thinking this looks aphid-like, but if you actually saw it in real person, in real life um, in front of you, they're, they're quite a bit larger than aphids. So damaged plants. Um, the damage inflicted by these bugs, again, is, you know, they stab their little needle-like mouth parts or sucking out plant juices. And you can actually see here um, the result of some of that feeding. And this is kind of a red, um, a yellowish red ring that develops on the stems where they're feeding. And the main reason this is a problem is because these areas get kind of corky. Um, they're weakened and they can become brittle and these eventually can break. So if you have a tomato plant that has a lot of large, delicious, heavy, pe um, not peppers, tomatoes, um, that weight can cause the stems to break as a result of this feeding. And they'll also feed on the flowers, as I mentioned, and small or, or younger fruits, developing fruits, causing them to fall off. So just some uh, pictures here of um, an adult tomato bug and also um, some kind of diagnostic damage of, of the um, tomato bug. So I just wanna point out here, obviously this adult does not look like an aphid. Um, it's, it's quite a bit larger but you might also think it's some other type of plant bug and there are some lookalikes out there. So um, this is an insect, if you're not sure um, what it is, if you see something like this, I strongly encourage you to please send it to the PPDL um, so that we can get our hands on it and help you confirm the ID. For me, I think something that's helpful in distinguishing this insect from, I'm gonna say aphids because that may be the one most, um, most of us confuse with this insect without having experience. The wings are much longer here and they're also quite transparent. So if you were to look at this in a little bit of a better photo, um, the wings would almost be translucent. So, oh, look, there's a little nymph here. You can see it doesn't have quite the full wings, but here we see the diagnostic damage feeding on, um, you know, the developing buds and flowers. It's kind of black and this, this will dry up and fall off. So another image here um, of what some of that damage looks like, you know, as time progresses. So here we have a, a flower bud you can see that's dried up and turned yellow that's been fed on and some um, younger parts of the leaves or at the time when they fed these younger parts um, now drying up and turning brown and eventually um, breaking off. So best management practices for the tomato bug. Um, I have to tell you, we don't know a whole lot about this. So this is just um, what we know for now. And just based on my experience and talking with uh, colleagues in, in our region, this is not typically a problem on larger commercial farms. And, and we suspect this is because um, those folks are using, um, you know, potentially more insecticides or certain products that are just knocking out um, this insect before it gets a hold 
Um, but small farms, um, particularly those who may be growing on smaller organic farms and hydroponic producers of tomatoes, um, these are the groups that we're kind of, or the growers we're hearing from that are saying, you know, we're seeing these little aphid-like bugs. And um, in fact, um, I think the two um, calls we've gotten or, or notifications we've gotten about this insect have been from a small farm and hydroponic tomato producers. So in terms of management in the big picture, um, our, our expectations and understanding so far, you know, suggest that things that manage stink bugs are also going to manage tomato bug. So, um, you know, whether it's your hydroponics uh, facility or your small farm, um, even your backyard, you want to scout the plants again regularly for tomato bugs and those symptoms of damage. And um, contact insecticides are likely to be effective, again, uh, just because these insects are going to be easy to contact on the plants. And we know that these are effective against stink bugs. And so we're, we're suspecting they'll also be effective against tomato bug. Um, there are some botanical insecticides and insect growth regulators um, that may also be effective against tomato bug, but we are still... Um, we still need to do more research to learn about that. And I mentioned these here specifically for tomato bug because some of these botanical products and growth regulators don't work as well for all the stink bugs that are out there. So I, I bring attention to those options, um, particularly for, for tomato bug, because we um, there is some evidence that they work. Okay, so that was tomato bug in a nutshell. Let me just make sure I'm keeping track of my time, okay. So the last insect I want to talk about is tomato penworm, and this is one that can be extremely devastating. And fortunately for our team um, and others included on this call, a, a grower who has had some problems has shared some images with us. And so I think these should be, these will be extremely helpful uh, for all of you to just become familiar with what to look for. And if you see these things, um, you know, you, you'll know, I can't wait. I have to do something. Um, I have to take action. So this is... Um, as mentioned here, an uncommon but extremely devastating, potentially extremely devastating pest. So the adult is this tiny little moth that's like a quarter of an inch long. It's very drab. Um, we actually call them micro lepidopterans or micro moths because they're so small, we hardly ever notice them. Um, the caterpillars are the damaging stage as with uh, many moth and butterfly pests. Um, they're also pretty small though, less than a third of an inch long when, um, when they are adult caterpillars. And so this image here, this is actually a really nice image. This is not what it looks like um, if you see it in real life. But if you looked at it under a microscope, um, one of the diagnostic kind of characters of this small little caterpillar, um, in, in terms of its appearance, it's going to have this kind of reddish purplish blotching on, on the body. And um, it's also kind of shiny. So it's, you know, some caterpillars are a little bit more fuzzy or hairy as we call it. This looks um, pretty smooth, has very few kind of hairs, but mainly this coloring and this modeling of this purplish grayish kind of appearance. And um, I don't really have time to go through the whole life cycle, but I wanted to mention that eggs are very small and, and you can find them, but it's likely to be uh, overlooked pretty easily on the plants. Um, the adults, as I mentioned, are very small, typically flying at night. So eggs and adults are actually going to be the life stages that are pretty challenging to spot unless you're out there really looking vigilant, vigilantly. Um, so it's actually the caterpillars you're going to want to be looking for and signs and symptoms of their damage, which I'll show on the following slides. Um, I do want to mention, though, that the pupa, um, when the caterpillar matures, it falls from the plant onto the ground and makes a casing of um, a little casing or a shell around itself to pupate or go into the pre-adult stage and then emerge as, an, as a moth. So this happens on the soil surface. So um, kind of foreshadowing here about how important it will be to maintain good sanitation um, in and around your tomatoes so that you don't miss these pupae because um, you could clean up everything else. But if you don't get those pupae off the soil, um, they'll emerge as adults and the cycle will continue. So um, a little bit about this insect that kind of makes it challenging to manage, well, definitely makes it challenging to manage, but also unique. There are some differences in, in where the younger versus older caterpillars prefer to feed. So these young caterpillars are small, very small, um, and they mine inside the leaves. And some folks may think, oh, it's a leaf miner. I don't need to worry about it. So it's really important that you pay attention um, to the mines. And again, I have images to, to emphasize uh, what I'm getting at in the next slides. Um, the older caterpillars will 
um, typically leave the mines and they begin feeding on the leaf surface. And they may actually tie just a margin of the tomato leaf over their bodies to protect them while they're feeding. They may fold the leaves over like a leaf roller even. Um, and again, they're doing this for protection. So um, those are key kind of uh, things to look for. And then when the, when the caterpillars are in the largest uh, stage, they will also enter directly feed, um, directly enter and feed on the tomatoes and just really create a huge mess as you'll see in the, in these photos coming up. So kind of putting all these things together about the life stages and how the, they feed um, egg to adult for this insect can occur in as few as 28 days and as many as 67 days. And as we know with many, in, as most insects, the warmer the temperatures, the faster this development will occur. So the hotter it is, the closer you're gonna be to 28 days for this insect to complete its life cycle. And in regions um, that are suitable, not necessarily our regions um, where we are in here in Indiana, but if you're growing in a greenhouse or high tunnels, um, there is the potential for up to eight overlapping generations each year. And so, that is a lot of eggs laid, a lot of um, generations of this insect emerging and potentially attacking the tomatoes. And I just want to mention here that when I say overlapping generations, eggs, caterpillars, adults, pupae, they may all be present at the same time. And so um, it's really important to keep track of what's going on with this insect, especially if you have suspicions that you're having issues with it, and also really um, keeping a clean uh, growing environment so that you don't miss any of these life stages and you can try to break the cycle. So just to show some images here um, or signs and symptoms of tomato pinworm damage, um, there are a few things I wanna point out. So one is the presence of frass and this is just insect solid waste or poop. Um, they kind of look like small little dirt specks here and you can see them all along this tomato leaf here. Also these blotch like leaf mines. So for those of you who may be familiar with leaf mines, you know, they can kind of look like a little jagged straight line. Um, these are a little bit different and that's why I emphasize your blotch like in shape. There may also be webbing, which you can see present here, um, also here, and these folded leaf margins. So you can see quite a, a large margin of the leaf folded over here, a smaller part here. Um, you can actually see a little caterpillar here. This is one of the smaller um, stages of the caterpillar. So there is a lot going on on this, this one leaf. And I would say, um, feel pretty confident saying that if you see something like this, all of this on a leaf, then um, this is pretty diagnostic for tomato pinworm. Um, a lot of the other caterpillars that you may see on tomatoes, you're not gonna see all these different types of things um, at the same time. So just another image here to emphasize, um, different stages of this insect and what to look for. Here we have a younger caterpillar. Here we have an older caterpillar. Again, the feeding on the surface, or in this case, the underside of the leaf, you can see a little caterpillar hanging on there. Um, here's a caterpillar kind of halfway in one of those blotches. And of course the solid waste um, that always follows caterpillars. So when people ask, where's the poop? Uh, that's what you look for. And that's how you know you might have a caterpillar um, aside from these other damaging um, signs of damage. So uh, last but not least, I wanted to show an example of damage to the tomatoes. And, you know, this is obviously um, extreme damage. And so these older caterpillars will move from, um, move from the stems and the leaves, especially if, if they're no longer available to them, and just burrow into um, the tomato. And you can see here the frass, or again, their, their poop, um, building on um, the surface of the tomato where they entered. So they're kind of in there feeding. And as they feed, they're just pushing the poop out onto the surface of the tomato. And this is a great diagnostic um, indicator. Um, well, other caterpillars do this too, but in this case, um, the frass is actually kind of dirt-like um, and, and the particles are quite small. Actually, now that I say that out loud, it's, I sound like a total insect nerd, um, but this, if you see something like this, it is definitely issue for concern. So um, this is just an example of damage in a high tunnel that was shared, um, images shared with us. Um, from the grower who's affected. And so you can see this is extremely devastating um, and obviously very challenging to, to rescue um, the situation when you have this type of infestation. So I just wanna mention a little bit more about the life um, or a little bit of background on this insect. So it's typically found in Southern climates. Um, we know it well to exist in Mexico, California, and Texas, but it's been increasingly reported from greenhouses in colder regions like ours. Um, and interestingly, this insect can't survive the winter in our region. 
And um, just to give a little bit of explanation for that, some of the insects that are adapted to our region, you know, they kind of go into the state of, of hibernation or what we call diapause. And that's how they survive the winter. They just pump the brakes on development and just sit and wait until conditions get better. This insect is not capable of doing that. So it can't survive the winter, um, the harsh winters in Indiana. So we suspect that it is being moved northward in infested transplants each year. And I emphasize transplants here and infested could be with the caterpillars, it could have eggs on them, um, that it's moving up from the south in shipments. But it could also be, um, some folks think it's possible that infested um, crates or um, other, other possible sources that would move the insect or some part of its life stage up to the north where we are. And so particularly in our region, um, you know, the reason we all love the high tunnels and greenhouses, right, that we're able to extend um, our production season, but that also extends the activity period of this insect. And um, so far, I would say that greenhouses and high tunnels, um, you know, if you see anything like this, I would say these are the, the producers who really need to be on alert because it's in inside these kind of structures that this insect is protected and able to continue developing and, and causing damage. Um, there have been some... Um, reports of damage to fields planted outside of these greenhouses. But again, once the winter hits, these, these insects can't survive. So if they're making it um, to the next season or moving, um, it's because they're surviving in a, in a protected environment that has the right food source. Oh, I thought I had one more thing there. Okay. So just minute mentioning some best management practices for this insect, sanitation is key. Um, if you are working in a protected environment or growing tomatoes in there, um, please, please be sure to inspect the transplants for, I say eggs here, because if you look really closely, you could find them, but mainly the caterpillars and signs of leaf mining as soon as they are received. And don't just do it the first time, do it every time you get a, a shipment of transplants. Um, a big management strategy for this insect, as with many others um, in, that are problematic in protected environments, you want to eliminate any green bridge. Um, and these are living, um, old like subpar fruits, plants that you may not be um, really actively managing, but you're not taking fruit for them either. Um, these can be a source of, of these insects to survive and move between each crop. So um, old plants, fruits that have dropped to the ground, um, plant debris like leaves, anything like that that accumulates, you want to remove and destroy uh, between each crop. And I didn't mention it before, but this insect, um, does feed on other plants in the nightshade family. That's the Solanaceae, so the tomatoes, eggplants, uh, peppers. Tomato is preferred, but they can feed on other weedy um, nightshade hosts. So I mentioned Carolina horse nettle because I know it's a common one um, in Indiana. And so these growing in the protected environment around protected environments could be a source of a host plant they can survive on until you have tomatoes again. So managing these weedy hosts is gonna help eliminate that green bridge. Last but not least, um, Systemic insecticides, the ones that you know you apply and then they are absorbed and circulated throughout the plant, these are going to be most effective in managing tomato penworm. And that's because, um, well, more effective than contact insecticides, I should say, because the larvae are often in these protected locations inside um, a mine under a leaf that's been rolled over. So, but they are feeding. So if you can get that product into the plant and they feed on the plant, especially the smaller caterpillars, um, you're gonna knock them down pretty well but it's so important you know that they're there as soon as possible so you can uh, get a handle on management. So I'll just very quickly go through um, the helpful resources. Ooh, I see that I'm pretty much out of time. You're all probably likely aware of the uh, Purdue um, Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory. So you can go to the website, submit a sample. You have different options here, submit a physical sample, a digital sample. This goes without saying, but the clearer the picture and the more of them you take, the better uh, we can use those to um, help you identify your culprit or pest insect. Um, if you do submit a physical sample, please submit as many as you can um, and be mindful of, particularly if they're insects, that they don't get smashed or dried up or get moldy whenever you send them in. So if you do have questions about um, submitting samples, feel free to reach out in advance and we can help you um, make sure you get the best bang for your, for your buck by making sure those insects get to us in good shape. Oops, last but not least, um, the Midwest Vegetable Guide is a great resource um, really to, um, to get 
an idea of the pests that you may be seeing, but also what management options are available to you. Um, so I, I bring this up because it's a great resource. You can also visit it online and actually, you know, search by crop or by your pest or, you know, by your control measures. So this is, I think a lot of people are very excited about this. I enjoy using it. And um, if you're not aware, uh, definitely check out the website. And, but if you're somebody who likes to have a paper um, book, you can also get one of those as well. Um, but this is my email address, eylong at purdue.edu. Hopefully you can still see this. Um, this is a great way to reach out to me and I'm happy to take any questions, but I also know I'm cutting into someone's time so I can bottle it up and uh, respond in the chat if, if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, we are out of time. I will appreciate it if you can uh, answer some questions in the polls. I think there's about three or four questions. There. Okay. <clears throat> Our next speaker is uh, Dan Eagle, and uh, he will be talking about uh, bacterial canker of tomato. Thank you, Dan. What I'd like to do is, uh, well, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, sorry we can't be meeting in, per in, in person. Um, I like, like Elizabeth, I like to talk about uh, things that I've seen lately, problems that I've seen. Bacterial canker is, a, is an old problem. Uh, but it, but a lot of producers have had uh, problems with this uh, in, in uh, recent years, and so I'd like to talk about some some possible management options. So if you you read the textbook on on bacterial canker of tomato, uh, you you'll find the first thing it mentions is this wilt, and certainly it can cause a, a wilt. Unfortunately, um, lots of other things can cause tomatoes to wilt, so that's not it's not super diagnostic, but it does indicate that the bacteria that causes bacterial canker can get into the, into the tomato itself, inside the tomato plant. But the, the symptom that I often see is this firing symptom, this symptom of yellow and red or necrotic and, and, and necrotic on the edge of the leaf. Now, this kind of symptom is not always uh, produced by a disease. But bacterial canker is 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 a, is a disease that causes this symptom in in abundance. Um, so it'll start off like this, and it'll get worse and worse and worse, and, and until the plant is is uh, not not much left to it, it's declining. But you can also find it if I if you're willing to sacrifice a plant, you go to the second or or our, our first node, and you cut it open, you may see this discoloration, and this is also an indication that the bacteria is getting inside the plant. So this discoloration is another symptom of bacterial canker. But I don't always see this symptom on the tomato plant or on the fruit. Uh, but when you do, this is very diagnostic of bacterial canker. However, I can see plants that are in terrible shape and, and still not have the, 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 these, lesions, these bird's eye lesions on the, on the fruit itself. And this, this photo here, shows uh, bacterial spot, bacterial speck in comparison with bacterial canker. So I think the, the fruit lesions on bacterial spot and bacterial speck are difficult to tell apart, but the fruit lesions on bacterial canker are, are, are very, uh, to me, they're very diagnostic, but e either one of them can ruin the marketability of the, of the fruit. But um, so bacterial spot and bacterial speck cause lesions. You saw lesions on the fruit and cause lesions on the leaves. If you look on the left, the bacterial spot on tomato, you see when there's like, when a lot of lesions are, are close together, uh, you, you can see that they cause a yellowing or chlorosis. And the middle photo bacterial speck, uh, in contrast, the, the, the yellowing is, yeah, typically around all of the lesions, not just where the lesions are, are close together. And then, of course, in bacterial canker can get inside the plant and all cause all kinds of problems, including this uh, wilt. So I put this table together to kind of compare. I know I'm supposed to be talking about bacterial canker, but I wanted to differentiate these. Um, the symptoms that bacterial canker causes a decline and other symptoms decline and wilt, we saw the firing. Bacterial spot and bacterial speck cause lesions on the fruit, lesions on the leaves, lesions on the stem. All of them may be seed borne. So that means they can all come in on seed, they can all come in on transplants. Elizabeth was talking with a pinworm about inspecting transplants. Same is true here, whether you're growing them or, or accepting the, the transplants 
from someone else. Importantly, bacterial canker is systemic. That means the bacteria gets inside the plant. This means that once you, you, you uh, it means a couple things. One, it's, it's not a, a it, it, once it's inside there, you can't get it out, of course. Uh, it's hard to manage. And it means it may end up in the in the greenhouse where a spot and speck uh, are not systemic and do not appear in, in the greenhouse. So, uh, as we'll see, uh, bacterial canker may be present in the in the tomato greenhouse when the tomatoes are growing to maturity, but spot and speck are unlikely. Um, copper resistance is a problem with bacterial spot. When a survey we did recently we found upwards of 80% of the isolates, the strains of bacterial spot, were not responding to copper the way we'd like. Uh, but canker and, and speck, are, 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 it's not a problem. And then I put uh, temperatures in which these diseases are, are uh, uh, optimum for. And the, the most important thing here to note is that bacterial speck is a rather cool weather disease. I typically see this early in the season. It may hang on later, but spot and canker are diseases more of, of the mid and, and later season. And that's usually. Well, this is a greenhouse. You can see the tomatoes in the center here have uh, bacterial canker. They're wilting, they're declining, they're stunted. Um, and although they're in a greenhouse, the, almost certainly what happened is the, this disease got started as transplants, and now they're inside the greenhouse, um, and, and the disease is continuing. Now, it's not going to spread from plant to plant there, but it can be a problem in the greenhouse, whereas, again, bacterial spot and bacterial speck are, I've, I put unlikely in the last slide, but I've never known them uh, inside a, a, a greenhouse like this. Um, so the systemic nature here is causing the decline of the plants. So how to, how to manage bacterial canker? So I want to have two slides on this. One is to talk about products. And what we're talking about here is treating transplants. We're talking about treating transplants. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the field, but it's, it's most important to treat these at, at transplants. So at the first true leaf, if you're growing transplants, you want to use a tank mix of copper and mancozeb. So mancozeb would be like, uh, Dithane or, or Manzate or Pinkazeb. You need to make sure that, that these are labeled for greenhouse use, but that should, should be no problem to find a copper product and a Mancozeb product. And the reason you mix the Mancozeb with the copper is it makes uh, the Mancozeb makes the copper more available. Um, I recommend treating a streptomycin product at the, at the two leaf stage. Now, streptomycin product may not be labeled for canker, but it is labeled for spot and speck, and you should be managing for these diseases as well. Trade names might include agromycin or harbor or um, other names. Importantly, uh, streptomycin is not labeled outside the greenhouse for any use at all. Now, if you want to use peroxide products like uh, Oxidate, that's fine, but do not use a, a peroxide product in, in substitution instead of copper, for example. Use it with those. So for example, if you're mixing a copper and, and, and an oxidate, you'd have to mix the oxidate if it's oxidate 2.0 at 0.33%. However, if you want to use the oxidate alone, you can use the oxidate at 1% volume to volume. Oxidate has no, it, it's effective and it disinfects the leaf, everything, anything it touches. However, um, it has no residue. It has no residue. So uh, once you once it dries, it, it's gone. So if you wanted, for example, to treat on a five to seven day schedule and you wanted to start at, at the first relief with the copper Mancozeb tank mix, in between times, you could spray Oxidate at 1% every other day if you wanted. Uh, because there is no residue, it's important to put it on frequently, right? So now, uh, manage bacterial canker in the greenhouse. Now, now we're talking about practices. I'll spend the next couple of slides talking about using a backpack sprayer um, instead of a garden sprayer. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Separate the varieties. I have another slide on that to avoid uh, spread between varieties. And then scout for questionable symptoms. Elizabeth was talking about sending uh, samples in. 
Uh, so if you have uh, quest questions about that, send those in, contact me or the diagnostic clinic. So this is a slide. This is a photo from Mary Hausbeck of Michigan State. It's flat of tomatoes. It looks okay. It might be a little something going on in the center there. If you look closely, it's got this etching on the leaves. This is actually bacterial canker of tomato. Uh, this it's on the outside, but it's going to get inside the plant. It's going to be systemic. And wherever those plants go, it doesn't matter what you do to manage them, uh, they're, they're going to uh, have problems. So purchase the tested for canker and inspect uh, transplants. So here, let's in this slide, we're imagining we have three different varieties here. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that you separate those varieties. So in, as you're watering them overhead, that it's not splashing from the, if there's disease in variety A, it's not splashing to variety B and then to variety C. So if you water variety A overhead, there's be splash, but variety B is far enough away that it's not spreading. This, if you'd get nothing else out of this, this talk, that, that this is critical that you do that. And, and, and then I would also separate if, we're, if you got variety A and you have different lot numbers, I would separate those in the same way. I would also clean and sanitize those trays. Now clean them first. And then if you want to sanitize them with peroxide products, quaternary ammonium, 10% bleach, I don't really have any preference, but it's important uh, to, to uh, clean these and then sanitize them in between use because otherwise you're, you, it's possible you're spreading disease to the next the next generation of plants, whether it's in, in, an, in another week or another year. So here's uh, a garden sprayer. This is what I call a garden sprayer. You might call it a hardware sprayer. Um, it, it, they're, the advantages are they're cheap, they're easy to find, they're easy to use. Uh, you put that in, put the product in there, pump it up and spray it. But there's also disadvantages. Um, this brass nozzle you see here is variable. You know, you can make it a stream or you can make it a spray. Nobody's going to spray pesticides out of there as a stream, but it's easy to bump that nozzle. And as you bump that nozzle, you've changed the spray and you've changed the output. The spray volume varies with pressure and time as well as we'll see. Both of these things make calibration difficult, if not impossible. So here, I actually have a YouTube video where, where I go over this. Um, but here, uh, I've, I've, I, I I've actually demonstrated this in front of groups. And if you put it as a stream, you see you've got a much higher volume in, in 30 seconds than you would as a spray. And again, you're not going to try to put it on as a stream, but it's easy to, to put those nozzles and change the output. Similarly, uh, the volume, if you pump it up five times or 15 times, it, the higher you, you pump, the more pumps you put on that thing, the greater the output, right? So if you're going down the row of tomatoes uh, or, or, or on a bench, uh, unless you stop every few feet and pump those things up, uh, which is a pain, uh, your volume changes, which again means the output and the calibration has changed. So here is what I suggest, a backpack sprayer. I purchased for $80, the three-nozzle three boom for $25. It's got a four-gallon tank. Importantly, it's got a pump and a gauge, okay? So as I'm walking down and I got that nozzle over my tomatoes, um, there's a pressure gauge. And I can pump, if I've calibrated that at 30 PSI, I can pump that and keep my eye on that so it's constantly 30 PSI. So I know throughout the whole greenhouse, I'm putting on the same, uh, the same output, all right? And, and, and there's no reason you couldn't use this in a field as well. And here's a nozzle, not a nozzle that can be bumped. It's a nozzle that is designed for pesticides. It's got constant output. So ma managing canker in the field then, also you'd wanna treat with copper and manganese. But remember, that if, if the canker is inside the plant, which are, you, you, can, you can hope to stop the spread between plants, but you're not gonna do anything for a plant with the bacteria inside. Again, you can mix it with peroxide or alternate it. Remember again, that peroxide has no residue. I'm not discouraging you from using it, 
but use it just use it properly. Avoid working fields when they're wet. There's evidence you can just if you're uh, get into one plant that's diseased, you can just take that uh, disease and, and work it all the way down that, that row, and then, then destroy affected plants because um, if and and remember that if you have a plant that you know has canker. And if you take that out and get it well away from that area, remember that the plants on either side are almost certainly affected with uh, canker also, and those should also be destroyed. Now, I put this slide here. This looks kind of busy, but um, this is uh, products that are organically listed or uh, are been approved for use by the Organic Material Review Institute. Now, of course, if you are officially organic, you're going to need to run these past your certifier. But let's go over these one by one. Here's the products. The first one is agrophage or agrophage is sometimes pronounced. This is actually a microbe that attacks the uh, bacterial canker microbe, right? There's also agrophage that are designed, if you will, for uh, bacterial spot. And, and, and bacterial spec. So you have to make sure you're getting one for canker. Um, and then, you, th so what I've done is I've gone in for each one of these and, and, and a journal that we have called Plant Disease Management Report uh, between this year and the year 2007, I, I looked for all of the agrophage, all the times agrophage was used for uh, on tomato for bacterial canker. And the number of trials was four. The, the number of those trials that, that agrophage was affected was two. So uh, two out of four trials, agrophage was effective. I'm convinced agrophage can be effective, but I don't think I would use it alone. Uh, if you use agrophage one time, you might use something else the next time, for example. However, you cannot mix agrophage with copper and you can't mix it with oxidate because it's a living critter and you want to be careful that you're not going to kill the agrophage. Copper was effective three out of four times. Here is cease and millstop. Uh, cease is a microbe. Uh, millstop is potassium bicarbonate. Uh, it was effective zero out of two times, but when you used it in combination with serenade opti and millstop in the field, it was effective the one time it was used. Serenade opti is a microbe as well. I should mention millstop is potassium carbonate, which uh, probably more effective with uh, fungi than bacteria but it, it would be effective against the cell wall probably. Double nickel is a bacteria, is a microbe and copper. Now here, if you read the double nickel label, it says you can mix it with copper. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, and it was effective one of one time, but then the double nickel used alone was effective one of one time. Lifeguard is a microbial product. However, it's a microbial product designed to turn on the plant defenses uh, it was effective one of one time. Uh, lifeguard, I've also shown, it can be effective on bacterial spot. However, you have to be careful. You cannot mix it with copper and you cannot mix it with oxidate. Oxidate was, was, was uh, effective one out of two times. And Tigro, which is a micro, micro of a bacterial product, was effective one of one time. So I put this together. I'm interested in your comments because uh, Lori Hoagland and I are... are uh, in the process of designing a website that would be similar to this. So if you have ideas about how to present this information, um, let me know. That's, that's all I had. Um, here's my contact information. If you have questions, uh, I can take them now or you put them in the chat and I'll, I'll watch for them. Or you can contact me later. Okay, um, our next speaker is uh, Steve Myers and Janine Arana. Um, they will be talking about simulated chateau tank contamination in cantaloupe and cucurbit tolerance to reflex herbicide. Thank you, Steve. All right, Petrus, can you hear me? Yes, everything is looking right. good. We're looking good. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, it's good to be with you today. Um, I'm going to give the first part of the presentation and then hand it off to my master's student, Janine, to talk about some of her master uh, research. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is a study that we did with simulated chateau tank contamination. And I've got my name on here, Janine's, but also a visiting scholar of mine, Natalie, who did a lot of the, uh, the, the groundwork for the slides that you're going to see here. 
All right, so just a little bit of background uh, for why we did this study. In 2020, we received a couple calls from cantaloupe growers in southern Indiana that um, really they had sprayed uh, clethodim, which is a, a grass selective herbicide with a surfactant and experienced a lot of foliar necrosis. So a lot of the, the leaves on their cantaloupes had turned brown and the what was green tissue had started to die. Um, in 2020, we took several high rates of clethodim and surfactant and tried to reproduce what they observed in the greenhouse and were unsuccessful with just clethodim and the surfactant. And so on the screen on the left there, you can see a photo of what typical clethodim plus surfactant injury looks like in the field, a little bit of uh, brown tissue at the growing point, a little uh, along the margins and some general chlorosis or yellowing. And on fo the photo on the right is an example of one of our high rates from the greenhouse study in 2020. And again, a little bit of foliar necrosis at the, the growing point, but nothing that's terribly concerning and nothing that matched the level of injury that the, the producers were describing to us. So with that in mind, sometime in the winter of 2020, it occurred to us that what could potentially have happened would be a Chateau tank contamination. So Chateau is a pre-emergence herbicide that has a 24C special local need label in Indiana for use in melons uh, applied to the row middles before you plant. And so Janine will talk a little bit more about what a 24C label is in her part of the presentation. But um, really what you need to know is that it's designed to be applied before the melons are in the field and, and directed to the row middles. The other thing that we know is that it has, um, hopefully known from valence listening, but <laughs> it has a reputation for sometimes being difficult to get out of the spray tank completely, especially if you don't follow proper cleaning procedures. Another thing that we know is that clethodim, the grass selective herbicide, has a reputation for cleaning sprayer systems. So actually taking some of the, the herbicide residue that's on the tank or the hoses and actually you know, detaching that from those surfaces. So the answer, the, the question that we were trying to answer is what if the clethodim application um, was essentially removing the chateau residue from the tank and depositing it on the cantaloupes? So that's the, the question that we're trying to answer here. So what we did, we've got 20 treatments that we utilized and it either included um, Chateau or it didn't. So if we included Chateau, it was applied at a 5% of the, the field use rate. I think the field use rate we used was two and a half fluid ounces to the acre. So um, in this instance, we would use 0.125 fluid ounces to the acre. Um, and that was either applied with or without clethodim, our grass selective herbicide. And then we utilized five different surfactant rates. And you can see those on the left side of the screen. So anywhere from zero to 0.25% by volume, which is what we recommend with uh, grass herbicide applications, then 0.5, 1, and then 2% by volume. So the 2% would be uh, eight, eight times what we would recommend for a uh, surfactant rate. Right, a little background, we used Athena cantaloupe and we did two runs of this study just so we could have confirming results across time. So this study was done at the Meg's research farm in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, and you can see they were sowed in the greenhouse May 28th, the first run, June 14th for the second run, and then transplanted. And then we let them established in the field a few weeks before we uh, treated them with our, our treatments. And we did this with a backpack sprayer, which you can see on the screen. So that's a stainless steel backpack sprayer. The tank contains CO2, which is our propellant. So it goes into the soda bottle and pushes out our herbicide solution, which is then sprayed through that the boom that you can see uh, in front of uh, my uh, visiting scholar there. All right, so the kind of injury that we see varies depending on the, the herbicides that we uh, applied. So if you were to see these two photos or you walk out in your field and, and you see this kind of injury on your cantaloupe, it's very likely that this is just a result of exposure from clethodim and the surfactant. So again, it's just kind of this necrosis at the growing point, a little bit of chlorotic um, tissue, especially at the, the growing point. And then if you see a little bit of uh, leaf crinkling or, or leaf distortion, you know, that could be a sign as well. If you start to see symptoms like this, you know, this, this can also sometimes be the result of a really high um, 
grass selective herbicide with surfactant, uh, more chlorosis, you know, an intervenal chlorosis, also some, some leaf spotting as well. And then um, the, the left photo there shows that leaf necrosis, but just along the margin of, of the leaf. And so that, that could be, um, but we're starting to get into a territory where, you know, if you start to see, to see these symptoms after you spray a um, you, you may have something else going on. And then certainly if you get to the point where we have dead petiole tissue, like you can see in the left photo, or speckling of fruit tissue, like you can see on the right, you know, now this is something that we wouldn't expect from our, our grass herbicide or our surfactant. And then certainly if your uh, row or your cantaloupe plants look like they do on the, the center photo, you know, that would be an indication that we've got something going on as well. All right, so the, the graphic here is showing kind of what these different pieces of the puzzle look like separately and together. So an example of a non-treated cantaloupe plant would be in the bottom left of the screen. If we were to apply clethanin by itself, you would see something that looks like the top left photo. Uh, if we just apply surfactant by itself, you get something that looks like the top right photo. And just plumioxazin alone would give you um, a plant response that's in the, the bottom middle of the screen. And then if we start to combine these things, so if we combine clethodim with surfactant, we get a little bit more injury, and that would be that top, uh, top center photo. Uh, if you look at the, the photo on the, the right, um, let me see if I can get my pointer here going. Uh, I don't know if that's working. But um, if you look, for example, follow the flumioxazin arrow and the surfactant arrow to where they meet, um, that would be the combination of plumioxazin and surfactant. And what we really see is if you look at those three center photos, that's the combination of all three. So our clethodim or our grass herbicide, our surfactant, and then a tank contamination rate of flumioxazin causes the most injury. All right, we got a lot going on here, but uh, basically if we look at the, the left side of this graphic, what we'll see are treatments that had zero flumioxazin. So no Chateau was applied with these. Um, but we do have both our zero and our eight fluid ounce rates of clethodim. And what we're going to do is draw a line here. So if we use herbicides, you know, inevitably we'll have some amount of prop response that, that we don't like. Some, some leaf chlorosis, necrosis, a little bit of stunting, something, right? So what I've done here is I've drawn bars at 10% injury. And the scale that we use is 0% would be no crop injury, 100% would be crop death. 10% to me is, uh, is an area that I feel comfortable, you know, drawing this line at. And so what you'll notice is when we're applying no simulated Chateau tank contamination rate on these left boxes, um, most of our injury ratings fall below that black line. The exception would be um, if you look at one week, the one week, so that'd be the, uh, the blue dots. The only time we see injury greater than 10% are when we use uh, two percent surfactant, which is something that we we should never really do. So, conversely, if we look at the right side of the screen here, that is where we actually had our simulated flumioxazin or or chateau tank contamination included, both at the zero and eight fluid ounces of uh, clethodim. And again, if we pull these lines in, what you'll see is that at week uh, one week after the crop is exposed to the herbicide all of our treatments are well above that 10% injury threshold. And the same is true two weeks after injury. And by four weeks, about half the treatments are still greater than that 10% injury threshold. So we're seeing a lot of damage from the, the flumioxazin or the, the Chateau uh, component here. The good news is that despite being very severely um, burned by the Chateau tank contamination treatment, the cantaloupe were able to recover. So this shows you what, what it looks like when we applied our clethodim with the highest rate of surfactant, 2%, and with the Chateau tank contamination rate. So all three things combined here. And one week after, it looks pretty devastating. By two weeks after exposure, it's really started to recover. And by three weeks, those plants look pretty similar to our non-treated plots. All right, moving on to cantaloupe yield. So overall, um, for our first run, we had six harvest. For the second run of this study, we had five harvest, and we harvested fruits that were 
um, you know, full size and, and would slip easily. Um, and so if we pull across all of those harvests, there were no differences among our treatments. So even though we had severely damaged uh, cantaloupe vines, yields didn't differ from our non-treated check, which is fantastic news. The one bit of difference we did see was with our first and last harvest. So this shows you the, the yield data um, per plot, fruit per plot from our first harvest. And so if you look at treatments that had no chateau, which would be the left side of the screen here, you can see that um, there were more small fruit harvested at the first harvest when we had chateau exposure. And there were fewer large fruit harvested at that first timing when they, when they were exposed to chateau. And this is what the, the uh, final harvest looked like. So the, the sixth harvest at our first run, the fifth harvest at our second run. And you can see at both, of, both the large and small fruit uh, were greater in the plots that received a tank contamination rate of Chateau. So essentially what this tells us is that over time, over five or six harvests, um, yield you know, is, is similar to our non-treated, but what we did see is a delay in, in fruit enlargement and, uh, and fruit ripening. So the plants were, were held back a little bit when they were exposed to this uh, simulated contamination rate of Chateau. Right, just some photos of our, our fruit there. For the most part, the, the fruit quality was unaffected. Some of the, the speckling did persist um, until, until harvest, um, although I think most of those fruit were still marketable. We did have one funny looking fruit and uh, that's the one you see with the face drawn on it. So hopefully that brings some levity to your day. We'll see. <laughs> um, just a, a slide here on proper clean out procedures. Uh, Purdue of course has an extension publication about how to do this extensively, but what you wanna do is spray out the contents of your tank, hopefully at the end of the day, at least once a day, perform a first rinse in the field, clean your screens and caps, perform a second rinse, use a tank cleaner, especially if you have a product like Chateau that has a reputation for hanging onto the tank, and then use a third rinse. So three rinses is important. The other thing you wanna do is, um, is make sure that you have enough volume of rinse water going through that spray system. So we target at least 10% of the, the volume of the tank should be included with each rinse. And another thing for some of our smaller growers that, that may apply with backpacks or, or can, can utilize this, um, one thing you can consider to avoid contam or spray tank contamination is to have dedicated spray equipment for different kinds of pesticides, whether it be fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, or have um, dedicated spray equipment for those herbicides that tend to be contamination problems. All right, so I'll go ahead and hand it to Janine. If you have questions about the first part of the presentation, uh, drop them in the chat or wait till the end and, and we'll get those answered for you. Hey everyone, I'm Janine Arana. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the curbage tolerance to reflex herbicide. First of all, um, reflex is uh, Active ingredient is formazofen. It's a PPO inhibitor with pre and post activity. In this case, we use it as a pre-emergence. Um, there's a 24C label in some Midwestern states in Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, and Ohio, but not in Indiana. And it's used at different rates in all these states, but it varies between six to 16 ounce, uh, fluid ounces per acre. Um, I obtained this information from the Midwest uh, Vegetable Guide that Dr. Long mentioned. Um, so what happened is that Indiana producers requested a local data to support a registration in Indiana. Um, for this, we need to obtain crop safety data, right? So the 24C label, it's a, it's a label from the FIFRA, which is a Federal Insecticide Fungicide Rodenticide Act that allows states to register additional uses of federally registered pesticide to meet special local needs within the state, right? So this is registered for other crops in Indiana, but not for cucurbit. So with the IR4 project, which is a new USDA project, we can uh, share the data that we obtain and they can help us uh, to obtain this label for Indiana for cucurbit crops that we studied. So basically, I like seeing how this, uh, an experiment is set up. 
what we have here is a split plot design. So we had five rates of mesophen or reflex. Uh, the zero is our control. And then we had two cultivars for each crop that we have. And we had these studies in three sites in Indiana, including Lafayette, Vincennes, and one at test sites. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we had two, two uh, cultivars or varieties for each uh, crop. We had pumpkin, winter squash, summer squash, and watermelon. Um, for winter squash, we had um, an acorn, which is here, and a butternut uh, but, uh, cultivar. Then for summer squash, we had a zucchini and a yellow squash cultivar. Um, for all these crops that you see here on the left under the yellow color, we use rates from 16 to 74 ounces. And then for watermelon, we use um, rates from 12 to 48 ounces. So for pumpkin and winter squash, sorry. So for pumpkin and winter squash, we sprayed our herbicide on top of the bare ground within one day after planting seeds. Uh, for watermelon and summer squash, we sprayed our herbicide seven to nine days before transplanting or one day, uh, some watermelon and one day before transplanting summer squash. So for our results, I'll show you emergence for winter squash and summer squash as a percent of control, then injury at two or four weeks after treatment and yield as a percent of control as well. So for pumpkin emergence, we can see that as the rate increases, our emergence reduces reduces, right? We had a difference in between years. In 2020, it reduced less than 10% our emergence. And then, but in 2020, it reduced more than 20%, around 25%. Here is where you can see our control, our controlled um, plots where you can see all the emerge plants. There's also they are also weedy. So that means we didn't, it's because we didn't use reflex. Now for the one X rate, it looks a little similar. There's some emergence reduction, but the plots are clean, right? That's what we like, right? And then uh, the highest rates that we wouldn't use, it's just part of the experiment. Uh, we see that the plots are clean. We come and see less emergence, but this only happened in 2020. It didn't happen this harsh in 2021. Then for pumpkin injury, we see that as rate increases, uh, injury increases, but at, a, at the rate of 16 ounces per acre, we only see a 10% reduction or less. And here's some of the injury or the symptoms that you can see in the field. This is a bleaching, it's a white spotting. And then we have this yellow spotting and it's chlorosis. And these symptoms were um, four weeks after and what we uh, what we've seen this is because uh, it's due to splashing. That means that the herbicide that it's remaining on the soil, and after a rain, it will splash onto the leaves and cause this damage. Because uh, we saw this injury only in the leaves that were closer to the ground, and not no injury like this on new leaves or something like that. Then we had only pumpkin yield loss in 2020 where we had the harshest, harshest injury and the harshest emergence reduction. But as you can see here, the 16 ounces per acre had less than 5% uh, yield reduction. And statistically, it wasn't significant. Now for winter squash, um, in 2020, we didn't have any emergence reduction, but in 2021, we did. Um, as you can see here, as rate increases, emergence uh, is reduced. But interesting the and good for us, the 16 ounces per acre that we want to get registered in Indiana didn't cause any emergence reduction, which is great. Here's what you can see. The control uh, plants look uh, great there. Um, there's no weeds because we already had hand weeded, but it did help our is weed control. Um, here you can see that the 1x rate uh, has a lot of plants emerge. There are some missing, but it's looking great. And then as rate increases, we see less and less plants per plot. Then winter squash injury, we saw that as rate increased, um, injury increased to around 80% at one side and only to 30% at Vincennes here. But the label rate, again, 
uh, produce uh, injury less than 15% in this case. Again, what you can see is some chlorosis and also bleaching. I did I couldn't find a bleaching photo, but it looks really similar to what we saw in pumpkin. Um, we had only winter squash yield loss in Lafayette in 2021. And if you remember the, the previous um, slide, it's where we had the most injury. So it's consistent to what we saw, but great for us, there's no yield loss here. And uh, in fact, the yield was better in this case. So we attributed all these yield uh, emergence reduction mostly to rainfall effect on herbicide zone. On the left, you see here that we need rain to incorporate the herbicide into the, into the soil. We want some herbicide zone to be able to reach weeds that are there. But if it drains excessive, excessively, then the herbicide zone will move to our crop's root zone, which it's uh, risky as for what we saw. And then we match our data to the rain, uh, the rainfall that we saw in each site. In 2020, where we had the hardest emergence reduction in pumpkin, it rained almost two inches, right? We only want one inch to uh, for it to incorporate the herbicide into the soil. Um, in the other sites, all the in the in all the other trials that were not pumpkin 2020, we had less than one inch, and that's when we saw uh, not a not a harshest emergence reduction as we saw in uh, in pumpkin 2020. So we have to be careful, and we need to plan really well when we want to apply this herbicide. Now, for summer squash injury, um, as I told you, we sprayed the herbicide before transplanting onto the plastic. Um, emergence was, uh, sorry, uh, injury was little. It was less than twenty percent, uh, than thirty percent. Even at the, at the harshest, are the are the highest rate. And at the sixteen ounces per acre rate that we won, we had less than ten percent injury. And what happened is that where we had that ten percent injury is because there was no rain before transplanting. So the herbicide wasn't washed off the plastic where it was washed off in Wanata 2020 and also in Lafayette 2021, there was no injuries because um, uh, the, the residues of the herbicide didn't remain on the plastic. Here is some of the injury that we saw. Again, chlorosis. This is at the, at the 16 ounces per acre and it's not as um, as... We cannot see it as good as the as we saw what we saw in pumpkin that was really yellow. So we only had summer squash yield loss in one attack 2021. That's where it um, rained after we had transplanted, and it was a lot of rain that we received. But as you can see, the 16 ounces per acre didn't cause any yield loss. And then for watermelon, we saw some injuries, um, less than 20% at all rates because it rained at all sites because we left a time frame of seven to nine days before transplanting. So there was a lot of time for the herbicide to be washed off the plastic. And then we didn't have any gel loss at any rate, which is great. So the take home messages here is that bare ground pumpkin and winter squash and plastic cultures, summer squash and watermelon are tolerant to the 1x rate of reflex. We need one inch of rainfall to integrate the herbicide to the weeds rooting zone, but the risk of injury increases with increasing rainfall on the bare ground because the herbicide moves to the crops rooting zone. And then rainfall before transplanting into plastic culture reduces injury caused by herbicide uh, caused by herbicide residue on the plastic. So thank you so much. And again, uh, you, have, you, hear, you have our contacts here. I'm a master's student working with Steve Myers. If you have any questions. All right, so there was a question in the chat about um, the, how the rate would vary across different parts of uh, the state of Indiana. And so, with that in mind, yeah, uh, we would typically use a lower herbicide rate on sandier soils and lower organic matter soils, and then um, you use the higher end of um, a use rate on those soils that were either had more clay content or had more organic matter. So that's kind of how we would answer that. So, um, and, and some of that 
the risk of injury is going to depend, like Janine said, on rainfall, right? If you get too much, especially on sandy ground, you can move it down in the soil profile where the seed's germinating. And if you get really large raindrops at the wrong time, you can splash some of it from the soil onto the, the leaves of the, the developing plants. So seems like we don't have any other questions, Steve. Okay. If you have more, drop them in the chat or reach out to Janine or I via email or phone and we'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, since this is a pop uh, session today, Jeff Berberg is uh, going to spend a little bit of time on the regulatory talk that uh, goes along with, uh, with that. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen here in a little bit. First, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Burbrink. I work up here in Elkhart County, uh, Goshen, Indiana, and uh, that's right on the Michigan line. If you go to South Bend, you take a right here in Elkhart County. Today's talk, I want to, I want to give a little talk about Driftwatch, which I'm a really big fan of Driftwatch. Uh, we've had, as, as most of you in Indiana the last couple of years, have experienced uh, with with all the uh, products that are out there that are fairly new that can drift these days, uh, Dicamba, 2,4-D, that kind of thing. Uh, these are not new products, but they've been reformulated. We've got some crops that are resistant to them. So the use is, has gone way up uh, for these folks that are growing, growing corn and beans to get rid of their herbicide resistant uh, type type problems uh, and so the it's just the use has gone way up and and because of that we've we've seen some issues with uh, with drift onto some of our uh, sensitive crops around here uh, drift watch is a program that that falls underneath the umbrella of field watch field watch is kind of the overall umbrella of a group of three different programs Driftwatch is the one that uh, spe specialty crop growers like yourself would use to register where those special crops are being grown. Uh, we also have Bee Check underneath that umbrella of Field Watch. Bee Check is a program where people that have apiaries can register where their hives are located. And, um, and uh, you'll see, I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Field check is another part of that field watch umbrella. And, and uh, in field check, farmers who are gonna be spraying those insecticides or herbicides or fungicides can check the fields that are nearby the fields that they're gonna spray and see if there are any sensitive crops or bees nearby. So I suspect this crowd would have a good chance of having specialty crops or uh, bees nearby in, in your fields. And, th and this fits right in with what uh, you folks would really want to be doing. Um, why should you do, use Drift Watch? Well, first of all, Drift is very expensive. Um, and from my experience, at least the, the growers that we've had up here that have experienced Drift don't always get all their money back. Um, Sometimes they will take that to court and that sort of thing, and they just don't get their money back for, um, for the, what they have lost. Uh, some of these crops cost a lot of money to get, um, to get uh, going, to get started. And, um, you know, once that's gone midway through the season or, you know, into June or something like that, uh, it's really hard to get anything reestablished that you can actually make some money back on. Um, so it's drift watch is, is going to be important for people that are growing fruits, vegetables. If you are growing organically, if you've got bees, those are the, the big categories there where you would need, uh, uh, where you probably should be considering signing up for drift watch. Um, there are a number of the commercial applicators and also the aerial applicators that download uh, the drift watch maps every time they apply. And uh, I've actually seen that happen uh, the, back in the summers of, uh, or I should say the fall of 2019 and 2020, we had large amount of acreage that was sprayed in Elkhart County uh, for triple E or 
equine encephalitis. And um, it was a it was a mess. We had a lot of area of that area was covered with Amish growers who had uh, organics. We had a lot of bees uh, in our community. One grower in particular had about 1,200 um, hives out there scattered around the various parts of counties. And uh, it, they needed to know where those things were. So I'm going to switch to the next slide. You should be seeing something that says uh, how Driftwatch works. Is that right, Petrus? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, Drift watch, um, basically the way it works is you take, you make the effort to plot out where your fields are in the drift watch software, which uses basically Google Earth. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen Google Earth, um, but it uses their maps and, and you can draw an outline around your farm where those grapes or those tomatoes or where your apples are. And you can, you can grow a box around there. And that's what signals the sprayer, the person who's going to be spraying in your neighborhood, that there's a, um, a potential problem um, lurking nearby that he may not have been aware of. Uh, another important feature of, of Drift Watch is that it, only producers that are growing commercial crops can register as that. And there is, there is somebody who checks that. Uh, in our state, the person who is in charge of Drift Watch is a wonderful lady named uh, Beth Carter, who works for the Indiana State Chemist Office. I've gotten to know her very well over the last couple of years. And uh, she looks at all these applications where the maps are drawn and makes sure they're just not a, a homeowner with a, uh, a garden in their backyard. These need to be producer oriented types of crops that are growing. Um, the pesticide applicators are, are then to check the website whenever they're going to go out and spray, particularly if it's a, uh, some of the products like, um, like dicamba actually tell the producers you need to visit this site. It's part of the label. It's not just a recommendation. Therefore, they are required to go to Drift Watch and look, or excuse me, Field Watch to see where they um, potentially have issues. Um, the applicators can also register where their farms are, or they can make it kind of a broad generalization of where they want new, to, new notifications to pop up. So for instance, I put, a, I put a box around my home and it says, if anything's within one mile of my home, I get a notification. And just last week I had a notification that an Amish person nearby was setting up an organic farm within about a mile of my property. So I thought that was pretty neat. Just it gives you an idea of what's going on. And if you farm uh, or if you live near someone that's, that um, farms several thousand acres, they probably don't know everything that's going around, going on around those acres. So that's why Drift Watch has become increasingly more important. So I'm gonna give you a look at what it, what it looks like. And this is, um, if you see that, um, that big, uh, this is the state of Indiana. If you had looked at this map about four or five years ago, you'd still see some bare ground. But since dicamba and uh, 2,4-D became more prevalent, uh, a lot of growers have jumped in and have their farms now registered. These really, really dark areas like you see up here uh, in my county and LaGrange County, uh, that means that a lot of growers have signed up. Uh, most of these growers up in this region are organic, certified organic Amish growers uh, that, that grow in the uh, Shipshawana, LaGrange, Middlebury area. So I'll, and you see down the side, you've got a menu. You can look for all the types of things that are growing, can, uh, certified organic, conventionally grown. Uh, beehives, Christmas trees, you can select what crops you want to put down there. Now I will show you another slide. Uh, uh, this is a close-up of the Middlebury Shipshawan area. Now here's Goshen, if you're familiar with the area, here's Goshen. Here's Middlebury, here's Shipshawana. LaGrange would be over here. And um, all these ends in this part of the map from basically State Road 13 over those are probably all Amish 
uh, organic farms that are registered in, um, in Drift Watch. So a grower uh, who, uh, or a farmer who is spraying 4D or Banville can go on and find out where these sites are in his neighborhood. And in fact, in, I have been told by some of our commercial uh, applicators that they have very little business spraying 2,4-D and Banville in this area because of all the organics. Whereas over here uh, to the west of Middlebury, uh, there's a lot of open space there and people can still probably get away with spraying uh, 2,4-D and uh, dicamba in those areas. So if you see one of these points here, like the bee, that indicates a beehive. Um, these ends mean non uh, or cert, cert, non certified organic. The O's mean organic. But if you see one of those little things, you can click on it. And here's what it looks like when you click on it. Click on one of those little um, markers. Well, this particular farm is Myron Miller's. He's a certified organic grower. Uh, his expiration expires this this year. So um, uh, what we have worked out up here with the Amish is we have created some fake email addresses. When when you um, when you uh, register for for um, Drift Watch, you have to put in an email address. Of course, Amish don't have email addresses. So um, in Lagrange County, they write Lagrange.ext. I actually set up uh, an email address that's a real email address, and it drops into my box. Um, it's a it's a drift watch at um, um, elkhartcounty.com or something like that, and it sends a message. So when they get their message that they're um, that they're going to expire in uh, in March of the of this year, then I will get an email and I can alert that grower that he's he's going to uh, need to put that back in if he needs to. So that's kind of what it looks like. And this is the same screen that a farmer might see who is getting ready to spray nearby. He can look up the person's telephone number and give him a call if he needs more details. So it's pretty, it's very easy to sign up. It is free. You simply go in over here and sign up. And then you plug in the normal kind of information that you normally do for any kind of website a username, an email address if you have one, you create a password, and then they will want you to give them uh, information like your address, maybe your, your farm name, your street address, uh, city, state, zip, and phone, and all that sort of thing. Uh, just the same information that you normally have to enter for any sort of website you're signing up for. Um, uh, applicators can sign up too. They basically do the same thing. They put in their name, address, that sort of thing. And here's where they can draw a map around the region where they farm so they can get notification of, um, of uh, new entries in Driftwatch. Very, very handy feature. So as a producer, you would fill in these things. You would go through and check what you're going to have. Uh, you'd select the crop year and then um, what state you're in and also what what type of crop that you're going to be plugging in and whether it's commercial, uh, conventional, organic or certified organic. Um, and then the active dates and such. So you're going to you're going to plug in information about your crop. And then you will go to a map. And since you have plugged in your um, address already, it will go to uh, the the address on that map. Usually, sometimes you may have to move it around a little bit. And then you will just simply use a mapping tool that's included. By clicking on this button, you'll have a little uh, place that you can go and you click on the corners of that map. And in this case, they excluded the farmstead. And you click on that and draw the outline of the farm where you grow your specialty crop. And then you simply hit submit and it is entered. At that point, the, um, the farm goes to Beth Carter down to the state chemist's office. She will look it over, make sure it looks like it's not a backyard. Sometimes she'll even call 
me if I if she thinks I might know a little something about it. Uh, we have had, especially when they were spraying for the Triple E, we had a number of homeowner, homeowners that tried to sneak their homes in so their house wouldn't get sprayed, but there was no provision built in for that. And so I had to tell, uh, or she had to tell them, no, you can't register your house on Field Watch. So uh, this is what the map would look like after after you're done, these might, this looks like they're all tomatoes in this particular situation. And they've mapped out several different farms where they're growing tomatoes. Uh, you will also get, uh, if you have an email address that you enter, you will get a, a notification. It says where those, uh, where those fields are. And it's, uh, that way it's kind of a confirmation for you to know that you are now officially registered in DriftWatch. The entries are in there for two years and then they expire and you have to recreate those if you're still growing fruits and vegetables. Uh, this last, last um, slide here is with is just the contact information if you've had some further questions. Uh, Beth Carter is the uh, person, the Indiana data steward as they call it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful young lady who is taking really good care of the, the uh, field watch system. And uh, we also have the field watch system is based at Purdue in West Lafayette. So she works very closely with those folks. So um, I will be happy to take any questions you might have about field watch and drift watch. Um, it has proven to be very useful here when we, especially for the beekeepers, uh, the beekeepers are kind of a difficult group to stay in touch with. Um, and by them registering in Bee Check, we were able to look those folks up, give them a heads up about the spraying that was gonna go on for the Triple E. Uh, and it was extremely useful to be able to get a hold of those people. We just need more of you to be in there to make it a little bit more effective. So if you have any questions, just let me know. I'll look in the chat too. Okay, there is a question there. It sounds like um, we, have a, we have some small growers growing on city yards. Uh, and if they are legitimate producers, that would be allowed, I would assume, because they're actually uh, they're actually doing something uh, where people will be buying that produce. So um, yeah, I would I would say I would put that in there and and send a note along with that. There is a place place for comments. You can send a note and say, yes, we do do this. And uh, I also see another comment about beekeeping. Um, uh, and um, I think that beekeepers could also plug that in where their, where their hives are located if they're in the city. Now, somebody else has a comment about wondering if there will be a place to do this for home gardeners and uh, in the future. And I don't know if that will be the case. I think the beekeepers can probably do that right now, but I'm pretty sure the gardeners wouldn't be able to do that. To be honest with you, it is a lot. It is work to keep those things up, uh, and uh, and um, sometimes it's a little difficult to get uh, the homeowners to understand that uh, this really wasn't built for them. Uh, somebody asking a question about our commercial Christmas tree growers, the only tree plantings that qualify, and I believe that is yes. I believe that there there is an entryway for them, but if you're growing walnuts or um, maples or something like that, uh, you probably don't have a place to register. I would say the best person to ask would be Beth Carter. I do know that Kurt Hadley's on here from Field Watch, and he may be able to. Um, answer your question also. It is a free program and it's voluntary as, as uh, Kurt mentions. And, um, and it is, uh, to me, it's a very worthwhile program. Uh, I spent the last uh, couple of years in October getting very familiar with it, more so than I ever really wanted to, but I had to because we had uh, 
40, 50,000 acres sprayed up here in this part of the world. And it drove a lot of us nuts uh, with all the homeowners that were concerned about pesticides being sprayed in and around, or around their homes. Yes, and uh, Kurt is Kurt is mentioning too in the chat there that Indiana has limited this to commercial agricultural crops. Hobby beekeepers are able to map. So, um, and it is it is the uh, site is managed by the state chemist office. Beth Carter, in particular. That is all I have, unless there's further questions about Drift Watch. But I'd really en encourage you, if you haven't looked at it, to go uh, take a good look at it and get your farms uh, registered. It is it is very worthwhile. <laughs>